All right, well, let's get started. So welcome everyone to today's webinar, uh, Applying Labor Analyses in Your Region. My name is Holden Andrews and I will be the host for today. Uh, our two speakers are CEO and Chief Economist, Chris Chimura, and our Managing Director of Consulting, Brian Shelley. So if you're new here, uh, we generally start these off with uh, an introductory slide into uh, who we are and uh, here at Chamara. So first, we provide labor market data and analysis so you can make informed decisions to help your community and business thrive. Chamara was founded in 1998 by Chris, uh, and we have two offices, one in Richmond, Virginia, the other in Cleveland, Ohio. All of us here are economists, data scientists, statisticians, and business professionals who truly, truly care about helping your community and your business grow. Uh, two things that drive us are client satisfaction and success. And as you'll see in a minute, we have a few things that we prioritize. One of those being excellence, both in customer service and data quality. Uh, Besides excellence, three other ideals that we really prioritize throughout our daily work are being thorough, striving for accuracy, and making sure that our data are useful. These uh, four things are what guide us as an organization, and they are what drive us and what we you know, work towards every single day. One way we really try to exemplify these values um, is through our labor market resources. We believe everyone deserves access to high quality economic analysis, which is why we offer a variety of free resources. One of these is our weekly economic update where we send out the most up-to-date national data and analysis uh, every single week. If you would like to be on this list, I will put a link in the chat where you can sign up uh, or you can send me an email, which will be provided at the end of these slides. Um, before I pass things off to Chris, I just wanna mention that we will be sending out uh, the slides you see today and the recording to all of our attendees tomorrow. And then if there are any questions during the presentation, uh, please do not hesitate to put them in our chat. Thank you. Thanks, Holden. Uh, just before we get started, just a real quick update to let you know that we're having our Jobs EQ Summit for Jobs EQ users uh, this year in Cleveland, Ohio, after two years of not having it because of COVID. So um, October 9 through 13, if you're interested in attending, it will be at the Ritz Carlton in Cleveland. And you may think Ritz, uh, something that I can't afford, but we got very good prices on the hotel room. In fact, it's, I think, less than the last two hotels uh, that we had in terms of a daily rate. Um, a good time to attend workshops, network with your friends and some of the um, colleagues that you have and people who work at Shimura. Talk to data experts. We'll have some people from within the company talking, as well as some people from outside. Um, for example, Susan Davenport, she's the Senior Vice President and Chief Economic Development Officer in the Greater Rich, uh, Greater Houston Partnership will be speaking and she will be talking about best practices in startup ecosystems. Uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of high tech B2B uh, new, new um, businesses that are starting in the Houston area. And she'll talk about that um, in particular, medical and aerospace are two areas. And then we'll have Mike Glavin, who's a senior director of Ter talent solutions with the Greater Cleveland Partnership, speaking about closing the gap, diversity um, and equity um, is one of the talks that he'll be giving. I believe he'll be uh, on two different sessions. So we hope that you can join us and please mark those dates. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to Holden uh, for more information. So. Um, now getting to our webinar here, looking at the national overview and labor market analysis. So in terms of the U.S., it looks like above growth trend through 2022. We've got the impact of the federal stimulus is winding down. The Federal Reserve policy is still very stimulative on the economy, and they're going to re be reducing that as we go through the year. Big question is, will we see a re recession in 2023 or a soft landing? And that's dependent on when will inflation slow, how far will interest rates go up, and when will the supply chain disruptions ease. So we'll talk about all of that before we hand it over to Brian to talk about labor market analysis. 
So in terms of the national overview, if you've been at our presentations before, you've seen this slide of gross domestic product, the broadest indicator of economic activity and around the globe, a recession is defined as two consecutive drops in GDP. But here in the US, we have the National Bureau of Economic Research, which has a business dating cycle committee that looks at monthly data, GDP is quarterly, and they determine when the recession has begun and ended based on uh, several broad indicators. Uh, for the COVID recession, it ended, it, it started in March and ended in April. So it was two months long, but that straddles two quarter, so two quarters, so it was a two quarter recession, a sharp rebound coming out of it. And then in terms of our forecast shown here in red, um, GDP actually for the first quarter is coming out tomorrow and most economists are looking for it to be a weak number similar to what we saw during the Delta variant time. And then after that, some fairly good growth around two and a half to 3%. Um, just as a baseline, anytime we see anything above 2%, that's considered strong growth. So at least through the remainder of 2022, strong growth. Then 2023 is dependent again on how much inflation is going to continue to tick up and how much the Fed is going to have to raise rates to bring it back down. So uh, in terms of some of the stimulus in the economy from the federal government side, a lot of uh, money was given to households uh, during the pandemic because people were told to stay at home. Many people could not even work. And so we saw a big increase in personal savings. In fact, if we go back over time, Typically, it's less than a trillion dollars. Here you see the last two recessions in gray. But with the stimulus money, it was up above uh, six um, trillion in this particular month of April. Uh, some spending occurred, um, and then we saw it jump back up in January, jump back up in March with another um, stimulus checks going out. So we were back up to six trillion. But now people have been spending down that money. And we're getting back to more normal levels, um, just above a trillion here in terms of the amount of savings that households have right now. So the impact of all this growth has come and gone in terms of the economy, and we don't expect to see much um, more support from the stimulus going forward. Uh, we have a very light um, labor market, as you all know. We're less than 4%. The unemployment will be out next week. Uh, for April, and we expect it to drop further. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you're looking at participation. So with gray shaded areas are recessions. The participation rate went up in the 70s. As more women were coming into the labor force, the baby boom was coming into the labor force. It topped out around 67%. And then when we went into the pandemic, um, understandably, the participation rate dropped um, at a strong pace, and it has come back. Um, but we're still only at 62.5 compared to 63 prior to when the pandemic started. A lot of people retired, moved their retirement forward um, because of the pandemic. And now, because inflation is starting to go up, we're starting to see some people who had retired and thought that they wouldn't have to come back to work are finding that their budgets are tight. And so um, they are coming some of them are coming back and that may be why partly we've seen a little bit of an increase but many people don't expect us to get to these pre-COVID levels in terms of in, um, participation rates. So now at a time when businesses are open back up there's supply or there's demand for our goods and services um, we're also seeing another factor that's causing it to be difficult to keep people um, employed and that is the quit rate. Um, typically, when we go through a recession, people don't quit their jobs to go to another job because of the uncertainty. If you quit your job and take a new job, it may not work out. Maybe demand for that product or service that's sold by that business doesn't hold out. And so quit rates always go down during recessions shown in um, gray shaded areas here. And it did go down significantly during the COVID recession. But the one thing that we saw coming out of it is that quit rates rose very quickly. And in November, we saw um, a peak of 3%. These data are collected by the BLS and they started collecting them in 2000. So that's the highest on record. Uh, 4.5 million G people quitting in November, 3%. And it has come back down. Um, in February, we saw 4.4 million. 
quitting, but 2.9% quit rate. We're still looking at fairly high rates. So we've got um, a very tight labor market. And because of that tight labor market, we're seeing wages going up and that's adding to the inflation complication. So here um, you see two measures of inflation, the consumer price index, which is the one that we hear about in the newspaper um, up over above 7% here. And then the PCE is the personal consumption expenditure price index, which is the Fed's preferred indicator because it looks at um, all the goods that are purchased in that month as opposed to the CPI, which is a basket of goods that changes every uh, couple of years. When we see people shifting from spending less on automotive and more on food, then that adjustment is made here in the PCE index and, and not in the CPI until they change the weighting. So clearly any indicator you see shows that inflation is a lot higher than it was in the previous decade or even two. And as a result, as I said earlier, we're seeing employment costs going up. So this is monthly data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, employment costs index up 11.5% in February from a year ago. And that is more than just wages and salaries, it takes into account other compensation. And again, the concern here is that when you see um, inflation going up and then wages starting to go up um, to keep up with inflation, you see a spiral happening. And this is sort of um, self-perpetuating um, and it's harder than to get uh, the inflation out of the economy. Um, typically the Fed, it takes six to nine months or longer for a rate increase to move its way through the economy. And so typically the Fed is is way ahead of, of um, inflation. In this case, they did not. They thought inflation was transitory, that they were seeing a lot of issues maybe relating to supply chain, um, but that was wrong. Um, and so now we've seen the start, Fed starting to raise interest rates. The only one they could directly affect is the federal funds rate target. So I'm showing that at the bottom, it's the daily rate that banks use to lend to each other. When that goes up, the prime rate goes up in lockstep. And then the three month, uh, the one year treasury, they will all start to go up. That affects um, rates that are charged on automobiles. The 10 year bond uh, typically goes up, but that's more related to inflation expectation. And then this impacts mortgage rates going up. So here, uh, the bottom line is we're going to continue to see rates going up um, as the Fed tries to get um, inflation under control. You may wonder how much more they will rise. Um, so Shabing and I are, are one of, uh, or two of 50 or so economists that um, were asked to contribute to the Blue Chip Financial Forecasts, a publication that comes out on a monthly basis um, and it shows our forecasts. Um, and the latest one that came out, um, April 5th, we just submitted our May forecast um, earlier this week. And uh, in terms of what the economists are thinking, they show everyone's forecast and then a consensus, consensus, which is the average of all the forecasts. So for the federal fund rate, by the end of this year, the one with the highest forecast looking for 2.6, consensus was 1.8. But I would expect when May comes out, these numbers are going to be higher, given what we've heard from the Fed and seen in inflation. The Treasury at 4.5 at the end of this year. And 2.8 is the consensus with the 30 year mortgage at 6.5, with the consensus being 4.7. As many of you probably know who are watching the 30 year mortgage, it's up above five. So clearly, uh, this will change. Um, the forecasts go out to the second quarter of 2023. And here um, you can see the consensus being 2.6 federal fund rate. I'd expect this consensus to go up to something closer to three, three and a half the next time we see it. The 10 year uh, continuing to rise and the mortgage rate, the highest um, in the third quarter was 7.5 and the consensus was five. And again, given just as quickly as rates have rise in the past month, I'd expect this um, to be much higher. So um, I have a quote here from Cleveland uh, President uh, um, Mester back in March, just because even though it's a month old, um, she was out earlier saying some things that more economists have gotten around to um, believing will come to pass. And that is what's going to happen with monetary policy, 
Um, the Fed needs to reduce their balance sheet sooner than they had expected. And by the end of the year, she expects the federal fund rate to be near the longer run target of 2.5. So the Fed has some target rate it's trying to get to, and that's considered to be the neutral rate, which is the rate where it will neither cause the economy to grow faster or to slow. Um, my expectation is that at this point, they're going to need to get the economy to slow. So it's going to have to go above that 2.5% um, neutral level. Um, so the big question is, will we have a soft landing from the Fed? And um, here you see um, the Fed governor or the Fed chairman bringing us into hopefully that soft landing. But at least in my estimation, even though it's not in our forecast yet, it looks like he's he's running on a very short runway. And it's uh, likely that we may end up seeing a recession in 2023 at, at some point mid-year to too late. Um, so with that as a background with the U.S. economy, certainly things have changed quickly over the past three years and even more so over the past four months, um, given all the um, things going on in the globe. So I'm looking forward to answering any questions you might have at the end. And now let me turn this over to Brian. Well, well, there is an infinite vortex. Let's go for this instead. Um, so uh, I hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, and I hope that uh, you enjoyed Chris's presentation. Um, so the big takeaway that I get out of Chris's presentation is that there's going to be a lot happening uh, in the next year and a half in the economy. And we're going to be headed for... Um, you know, a slowdown, basically. And that uh, will influence decisions that you need to make, uh, a lot of which will pertain to workers. And so we uh, need to talk about how we can get the information to you um, that's going to help you uh, anticipate your employment needs in the next um, year, year and a half during this critical period. Uh, and uh, what else we can, um, um, what, what else you can expect. Um, and so one way you can do that is with Jobs EQ. I expect that a bunch of you are Jobs EQ subscribers already, but sometimes you need to go above and beyond what Jobs EQ can show you. Um, and you still can call us because my team, uh, the consulting team, uh, does labor studies all the time. And, and we'll get into what goes into a good labor study in a second. But if you're still on the webinar, why should you care, right? Um, who needs a tomorrow labor study? We can see the, the first point here is really the biggest one. Anyone who needs the most accurate data and expert analysis of a region's labor force. And that's probably all of you that are on this call, right? Um, at each one of you is a key economic actor in your region, and you need to understand what's going on in the labor force. Um, my, uh, for my business people and my site selectors out there, uh, you need to understand if you're facing a relocation decision, whether you should uh, go into an area or not. And to understand that, you need to know if you have the workers to support those operations. Um, economic developers, you're on the other side of that equation, um, and you need to understand um, when a business comes to you and says, do you have the labor to support this business? You need to be able to say yes, or you need to be able to say, well, maybe this isn't the best one for us to go after, right? Um, workforce developers and educators, uh, you need to understand the local labor market because you need to understand what the jobs op openings are now because you're trying to get your clients or your students placed in jobs uh, right after graduation, immediately if they're out of work. And it sounds like with the recession coming, you're gonna start to see a pickup in your need, uh, in the need for your services workforce developers. Um, and you also wanna make sure that you're preparing uh, your clients, your students for the jobs of the future um, so that they can continue to be in strong economic uh, straits when they get done with your services. So um, let's talk first to my businesses and my site selectors that are in the audience here, right? 
Um, so you know, right, in Area Development Magazine, if you don't know Area Development, they're a wonderful magazine, um, and they do an annual site selection survey. And every year when you look at, um, they ask site selectors, businesses, what's the number one thing that a location needs to have to be a desirable place for a business to set up shop? And uh, every year, the first or second criteria that they list is an adequate supply of workers um, in the right areas, right? Making sure that a region's labor force is tailored to the needs of the business that's moving in. And if you're a site selector, if you're an economic developer, uh, our data can help you make sure that the labor is available to staff every position and, and, and you can understand how much it costs you understand what your total payroll is going to be. Um, and the analysts that work on these projects for us, that work on these consulting projects, uh, can help you understand how to fill hard to fill positions. So what does that mean, right? Um, so let's go, let's say that we're gonna open a 100 person utilities plant in uh, Richmond, Virginia. One of the local uh, or you know state utilities says, we need to open something up and we're gonna do it in Richmond. So the first question they're going to have is, do we have the workers? And Tremera can answer that, right? Um, you see here, this is part of the list of, um, um, we like, so we can say on average, when somebody opens up a 100-person utility plant, they're going to generally need uh, nine electrical power line installers, eight water and waste and treat plant uh, and system operators. And we base that on what similar locations have done throughout the nation, right? And so what we can do is we can analyze, this is the number you're gonna need, this is the number of electrical power line installers that are in the area right now. Um, and we estimate the ratio, right? So um, you can see nine opening, if you take 475 uh, place, uh, employment place of residence, and you divide that by nine, you're going to get about 54 candidates for opening. And that's good. What our research has shown is that you need about 50 workers in a given occupation for every one spot that you're trying to fill. And so uh, uh, 50, to, 50 to one ratio is great. You can see here, Richmond is actually in really good shape uh, for most of the things that you'll need to open up in utilities plants. You need eight waste uh, water and waste water treatment plant operators. Um, well, we have about 422 of them. Your ratio is great. But what about if you get down here to uh, power plant operators, right? Um, and you see that we need four, but we only have 112 that are in the place of residency. And you can say that like, oh no, that's 28 to one. Does that mean we can't go forward with this project? Is that not a good enough ratio? We're going to have a hard time hiring people. What we also look at is this employment extended, right? And those are all the people who work in jobs similar to power plant operators. Um, and that maybe with just a little bit of training, they could be reskilled, upskilled, so that they're able to fill the role. Um, and so you, as a work, as a business, can say, like, okay. We might be a little short, but look at all these people um, um, that are able to be trained um, and that we're probably going to be able to find the four that we need. Um, you could also say, right, that for a specialized uh, skill set like power plant operators, we're going to assume that we're going to hire those from out of the region and get them to move, right? But the point of which is whether or not you, you uh, uh, need all the work or whether or not you get the workers as the uh, as already working in that field, or whether you need to go into employment experience extended, we've got you covered and we can help you find uh, the workers that you're going to need. We can also help you understand your payroll, right? So this again, if you look up, same chart, same list of occupations, you can see here at the bottom, I cut off because there's actually, if you do a hundred person utilities plant, they're actually probably about you know, 40 occupations that you need to fill, and they don't all fit on one slide. Um, but you can see here, right, we can give you uh, not only how many you need, but what you're going to pay in the region. 
Um, so for our electrical power line installers, they cost about, uh, on average, 73400 And I don't have it listed here, but we can also show you the entry level wage, what somebody's going to be making as an experienced worker, uh, the 10th percentile, the 25th percentile. We can do all kinds of stuff at wages to help you estimate what you're going to pay for this talent. And you can see that we can do an estimate uh, that we think is pretty darn accurate and that our uh, data scientists have found tracks very well with the records that we have, that you're going to spend about six point, uh, well, about $7.0 million um, on your regional average, uh, on your total payroll, if you open this plant here in um, Richmond, Virginia. Um, and there's all kinds of things that we can do. Obviously, if we can tell you this for Richmond, Virginia, we can also tell you this for other regions of the country. So our analysts, uh, we're doing a project like this right now, where our analysts are going in and comparing different regions of the country um, to see if they are the right place for a certain type of manufacturing. And um, we can sort of rate those um, um, people on a, um, on, a, on a variety of factors and then give the uh, results to you so that you as a business or you as a site selector representing a business can know with confidence um, where the site that has the best labor conditions, not just total workers, not just wages, but about 14 factors, where is the best place for you to relocate, right? Um, economic developers, what can we do to help you? Um, when you're, as I said, you're on the other side of this equation, you're trying to get business to come in. You're trying to woo those businesses and the site selectors. So what our data and analysis can do is help you make the case uh, that you are the right place for a business to relocate. We can help you understand your competitive advantages as a region so that you know that we should be chasing certain types of business because we have a higher chance of being success, of being successful, excuse me. Um, and um, one of the ways that we do that, right, is we've got this sort of grid. Grid. So let's say that Erie, Pennsylvania wants to get involved in a competition to attract a 75-person sheet metal work manufacturing facility. Uh, I don't know if we have anybody from Pennsylvania on the call, but um, Erie is in one corner of the state. I grew up in Philadelphia, the opposite corner. But I still have some fear, uh, some uh, fun feelings for anything in Pennsylvania. So we're gonna talk about Erie, right? Um, so what Erie wants to know is how competitive are we going to be if we go after this uh, 75 person sheet metal work manufacturing facility? And I talk about all those different, this is kind of our secret sauce um, that we look at to understand um, site selection decisions. And you can be sure that if you are an economic developer, your site selectors and your businesses have this information about the strength of your region versus other regions. So you need to do, know it too so that you can make the best possible case. And what we'll do in this analytic is we probably pull, and Chris can probably tell you the exact number, we probably compare about 260, 270 uh, MSAs throughout the country. Um, and we can tell, we can rank them according to a bunch of these factors, um, and we can say this is the best place to build a sheet metal work manufacturing facility. And so you can see that according to our secret sauce, the best place to do it before you consider things like incentives and specific properties and things like that is Gadsden. Gadsden rates the best on our ratio. But Erie's pretty good, right? Of those 260, 270 that we, uh, uh, metropolitan statistical areas that we have in the database, Erie ranks 10th, right? And you can see here, they have almost all the labor that you would need. Um, and again, we can get in some of that employment extended to fill those holes that aren't there, right? You can see that they get it for a pretty reasonable payroll, that the cost of living is pretty good, that uh, turnover in the region is pretty low. Um, and that LQ, if you don't know what LQ is, it's called location quotient. And this is a measure where we look at the relative competitiveness of an industry compared to the nation as a whole. So the nation as a whole, we set to one, right? Um, and so like, like the average market in the United States 
is probably going to be about a one for uh, uh, how competitive they are in the metal sheet metal work manufacturing industry. The more you get above one, the better off you are. And you can see right here, 3.85, if we sort it on this column, you can see Erie would be pretty high on this, right? So that indicates that if you're that Erie economic developer, darn right you should go after this, right? You're one of the best locations. And with this data um, and other data we can show, you can really make the case that you are the best place um, uh, for the sheet metalwork manufacturing facility to be. Um, my teachers and my workforce developers, right? Um, you need to help the people you serve be ready for the future. Um, you need to be able to tell your uh, workforce development clients. You need to be able to tell your students who are seniors, who are career and technical uh, education students who are going out into the job market here in another three to four months. You got to find out who's hiring right now. Uh, you have to make sure that your students have the emerging skills, right? It's not good enough uh, to know how to do uh, a machinist job 10 years ago. You have to know those things that are emerging, that, that are the newest trends. Um, and if your students or your workforce clients know that, they're going to be in a better position to get the best jobs. Um, and you also want to prepare them not just for the jobs of today, but tomorrow. You want them to have good career paths. And so you want them to be able to... Um, you want to know that those jobs are going to be there for them in the future. So let's ask another question here, right? Um, and we can ask whether we should prepare our clients uh, or our students here, I'm using the workforce development language, um, to be maintenance and repair workers, right? Maintenance and repair workers. There are a couple of questions we might ask. We might ask, is it a good career with people for a high school degree? Does it pay enough? And is it forecasted to grow in the future? And again, these are the types of questions that our analysts are thinking about every time they do a labor market study. So let's see if we can start to answer them, right? And we're back in Richmond, Virginia here. So we're looking at Richmond, Virginia. We're probably going to recommend a maintenance and repair work career uh, to somebody with a high school education. Um, and you can see that that is a very, um, uh, uh, this job is very accessible to people um, with a high school degree. You can see our education breakdown right here, some of the information that we can provide in the labor study, that the majority of them uh, uh, counting some college no degree, a high school degree, or less than a high school degree. Look at that, that makes up close to two thirds, uh, more than two thirds, close to 75% of the total here. So this is a good job for people with a high school degree and it's one they can get. Now, as far as why it's a good job here, you can see, right, that not only are these jobs um, um, pay pretty well, 45000 I think, is just about at the regional average for um, Richmond, Virginia. Um, so this is going to, you know, you're going to be able to make your way uh, through life uh, on a, uh, as a maintenance or repair worker. And you can also see that we project strong growth. Our analysts can see strong growth in the next uh, two years. You can see that it's going to grow by about 2%. And that um, in two years in the Richmond, Virginia area, and again, we can do this for any region of the country, there's going to be about 1,331 jobs that are going to open up. So, yeah, they're going to be jobs for them, and they're going to be jobs in the future, right? You may also want to know, okay, what are the jobs right now? I got these high school students, they're going to graduate. I got these workforce clients, they're out of work right now. Um, or they're going to be out of work as the recession hits next year, right? How do you get out ahead of that? Well, we pull in job postings every night. We pull in like a million job postings each night from about 40,000 uh, different websites. We go from everywhere from like the Indeeds and the Monsters of the World to uh, company boards, like we pull from the Capital One board. Uh, we probably pull from the city of Richmond's jobs portal, um, all these different places, right? And so we can tell you how many people are hiring, how many positions are open for hiring right now in your area. And you can see right now that maintenance workers, one, you see, we're comparing here between this is basically this year versus last year the last 12 months compared to the 12 months before that. 
And what you can see, right, is pretty steady demand. Uh, no surprise, because things are always breaking and things always need to be fixed. That's where our maintenance people come in. And you can see right now we have 3,602 active job ads in the system. Um, and so that's the type of insight we can give you if you're in workforce. Um, um, now, those of you who are job DQ clients probably have said, okay, that's a lot of stuff that, uh, that uh, some of which I kind of recognize, maybe I don't have access to that analytic and I want to get it, but it's basically part of my job DQ uh, uh, package. But what I want you to understand is that when we do a custom study for you, we go beyond job DQ, right? First off, you get our expert analysis. We probably at this point um, have about 60 years worth of uh, experienced economists sitting in this um, office today. Um, and that's the kind of expertise that, you know, even if you're a power user of Jobs EQ, you can't get the most out of the data the way that people like Chris are tra trained to do so. And then the other thing, the more important thing is that we got a lot of data contained in, uh, that's not contained in Jobs EQ that we bring to your labor market studies. So you can see um, uh, some of the things that we bring in here. I'm going to talk about American Community Service data here in a second. Um, but, um, uh, oh, gosh, I'm blanking. Chris, what's CPS? I'm blanking. Okay. Chris is Sorry, current, popu current population survey. Current population survey, yes. Uh, this is what happens when you're giving a webinar at 4.07 Eastern Time. Uh, you forget things that are your job. Um, but so uh, that can give you individual responses to, uh, to, sur to surveys so that we can create new groupings by age, race, ethnicity. We know diversity is becoming an important part of hiring. You want to know that you can hire not just the right workforce, but the workforce um, that represents a region. And uh, we can tell you all about that with the ACS and CPS microdata. We can tell you a lot about what's happened in the pandemic. The census pulse surveys uh, are things that we analyze to understand what's happened to households and businesses throughout the pandemic. Um, business dynamite statistics, you wanna know how many firms are starting up in your area. You wanna know what new jobs are being created and what jobs are going away because things are failing. Uh, patents to monitor innovative research, international trade data on imports and exports. Retail sales, building permits, automobile sales, oh my. Um, this is just some of the stuff that we can bring uh, to our analysis. But I want to go back to that ACS data for a second. So the ACS is really neat because the ACS asks a host of questions and um, uh, about everything from the economy to social conditions and, and, and all in between. And we analyze that data very frequently to understand um, what the conditions are that are happening at sort of a real micro level. So we did some research for a great organization called Jobs First NYC. They support the workforce development apparatus of New York City, right? Um, and so they do a lot of important work. And they wanted to know everything they could about out of school, out of work, um, um, youth in the um, in in New York City. So out of school, out of work. That's what OSOW means, and that's exactly what it says. Uh, young people ages 18 to 24 uh, who are not currently enrolled in school and are not currently working in a job. And so you can see one of the things that we did was track. We tracked pre-pandemic um, how many uh, how many of them were in New York. And the ACS data and our analysis lets us do that, right? And so you can see that it went from 22% to 2019, uh, in 2019, going down to 15%. And that was great, right? But they commissioned this at the beginning of the pandemic uh, or sort of midway through the pandemic, I should say. And so the really unfortunate thing is, is all this progress that they had made in 2010, from 2010 to 2019, getting uh, young people either re-enrolled in school or back in work um, kind of went away at the beginning of the pandemic and it's recovered some since then. Um, but again, this is some of the stuff that we can tell you. 
We can also tell you who these out of school, out of work students are. So we looked at by race and ethnicity, who are these, um, who, who are these young people? And you can see, right, that um, 44% of them in 2019 were uh, Latinx, 30% uh, were black. And um, so understanding not just that there are OSOW uh, students out or young people out there, but that they are uh, who they are, right? And we can also understand where they are. So this is one of my favorite slides from the presentation that we did, where we looked at where throughout New York City, out of school, out of work, young people were concentrated. And you can see, right, we provide uh, uh, spatial mapping and things like that of all this data, that stuff that our team can absolutely do. Um, all the graphics in this section were designed by our team. And so you can see, right, by sort of a heat map here, um, the darker the color that you get to, or the closer to purple you get, uh, the more concentrated in an area out of school, out of work students are. So there's a lot of really neat stuff we can do with ACS data. And so if any of this, any of the things that you want to know about social trends, economic trends, maybe you're in job GQ, you can't find that out. You want to know um, if there's something we can do, uh, you know, send a line to Chris, send a line to uh, me, and we will talk about what we can find out with some of our other data sources. Um, job DQ fit certification. If you hung on this long, we want to tell you about uh, a really great program that we have called fit certification. It is our customized training course for job DQ. It's cheap. It's $400. And for $400, you get, uh, i trying to remember when I started this, I think you get like seven or eight hours worth of job DQ training, the kind of stuff that Greg Jamara, our uh, chief quality officer, the kind of stuff that he does for fun, right? Um, the stuff that like, if you want to be a true expert on the data, you walk through this course, you're going to be there, right? Um, we got knowledge checks and quizzes to make sure that you understand that. Um, and so um, you get to do things in the course, like set up custom regions. So you can pause the course and say, oh, they just taught me how to set up a custom region. I want to set up a custom service region for our area. Let's go ahead and do this. And again, while you're doing the FIT certification, you're, innovate, you're integrated with our chat team. So if you have a question about the FIT certification, you just shoot it right there and you get like a response in a minute. Um, you should email Tolden if you want to get into that. Um, and he will contact you with your client relationship manager. Um, I think if you have a Jobs EQ subscription, this is the smartest thing you can do because it's not expensive and you really will. It, this ensures that Jobs EQ will not just sit on the shelf and be another software product you forget about. This ensures that you're going to use it to its full capabilities. So that is the end of my story so i guess uh we can move on to questions yes that's thank, it, thank you brian yeah great great information and holden sent me one question from nikki uh to help employers prepare for a potential looming recession would you suggest they strategically start moving to a more temporary workforce opposed to um a more direct hire workforce. So yeah, this is something that's an interesting question that typically ha happens as we're going into a recession um, because um, businesses are not sure if they're gonna be able to keep the employees long-term that prefer to hire temporary uh, or even coming out of a recession when they're not certain it's going to be sustainable, they, they do the same. So. Yes, that may be, and, and it depends on whether or not the industry is sick. If it's very, very sick, if it's not cyclical, like hospitals typically don't see downturns or healthcare during recessions, then I would continue uh, direct hiring. Good question. Uh, hey, Chris, I think we lost you um, right at the tail end of your answer. You were speaking on um, whether or not things were cyclical, and you gave an example about, I believe it was a hospital. Could you just repeat that example real quick? 
Sure. If if we're looking at a hospital which is typically not cyclical, typically doesn't decline during a recession, then I would continue to make direct hires. Okay. Um, got a question, and uh, Brenda Brenda Martin sent it directly to me, but I'm, I think it's good for everybody, so I'm going to share it. Um, and she asked, is it feasible to run a study asking what high-tech companies could our region attract? Yeah, absolutely, right? We can get into understanding what labor you have available in your market and understand how that matches the labor needs of different high-tech industries. So, yeah, I think that's absolutely something that we could do. Uh, Brian, we have another question. This one from Brandon. Uh, is there a way to cut off sites in any way? In other words, use that same analysis, but with, say, 10 or 20 predetermined sites. This was uh, in reference to the uh, Erie, Pennsylvania example that you gave. Yeah, and, and I referenced the study that we're doing right now. That's exactly what we did. Uh, we helped a company. We basically, they wanted to know every site in a certain region of the, con uh, in, of the country was it appropriate? And then so once we so showed them everything that we thought might be appropriate, they said, all right, we have this with these four or five we really want to know more about. Um, so, yes, we absolutely can uh, focus. If you have specific locations that you want to look at, we can do a deep dive on those locations and tell you how applicable um, the current labor supply in those areas uh, is for what you need. Awesome. And then as a follow up, um, Brian, is there a way to do that in the labor EQ analytic? Um, yeah, some of what I showed you is in the labor EQ analytic today. And so I think you can do some of that to compare the stuff. Um, I think a lot of times um, people like labor EQ is an amazing tool if you know how to use it. It's tricky. Um, and so a lot of times we will have um, um, people will come to us and say, like, can you help us make sense of Labor EQ? But if you are a Jobs EQ subscriber, I'd absolutely say start with Labor EQ, talk to your, um, talk to your CRM, and see if you can talk with the chat team and see if you can puzzle through it. If you're not getting what you need, that's when you give our team a call, and we'll be happy to sort of get not only what's in Labor EQ, but a bunch more information that we'll bring to the table. Perfect. Uh, and and Cindy here has a question about, does the study come with an annual subscription cost? Um, no, we can certainly do a study for you annually, but these are all, this is another advantage over um, that some people choose uh, a labor study over Jobs EQ, is that you can get the labor study, you have it for a specific project, you get it once, um, and then um, you have the information and you can use it. If you need to update it, sure, you need to pay us again, but, um, um, it's there's no annual subscription cost. Awesome. Um, we've got another question from uh, oh, Chris. I see you answered it uh, in the chat. So a uh, question from uh, Thaddeus. How do Jobs EQ and Labor EQ differ? So Labor EQ is a um, and I am it's been uh, about 18 months since I've been in the software sales side of things is labor eq included with jobs eq pro so it depends on we'll just sit here and we'll say it depends on what package of jobs eq that you have labor eq is an analytic that sits within jobs eq i don't think it's available on the basic pro package i think you have to subscribe for um for sort of the works the deluxe car wash whatever we call it here and labor EQ is very similar to that Erie, Pennsylvania side, slide that I showed you um, with um, certain things uh, highlighted in green to say we're very competitive in this area, ranking the different areas and stuff like that. So again, it's an analytic within Jobs EQ. Um, awesome. Well, I believe that is all the questions that have come through. Oh. Holden, can I ask my question? Oh, yes, you can, Brian. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, I, I know I had you down the hallway, but I figured other people might be interested in hearing this, too. Um, uh, so Joe Biden yesterday or earlier this week started to talk about student loan forgiveness. Um, assuming that were to happen sometime this year, 
what would be the economic consequences of that? Chris? Chris, are you there? Yes, my microphone doesn't seem to be working very well, so I, I may not be answer, able to answer this question. Um, well, for one thing, that would be stimulative to the economy, so that could accelerate inflation. If those students no longer have to pay off those loans, um, and so then they would have um, more uh, discretionary income to spend on a monthly basis. And I haven't seen all the specifics of it, so um, I'm not sure the impact. It would increase our deficit, so that may have a negative impact on slowing growth. Um, but I haven't read the specifics of it. So just off the top of my head, those are the, the two things that come to mind. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any uh, further questions, either from Brian or in the chat. Um, so with that, we can uh, call it a day. Uh, as a reminder, I will be sending out both the uh, webinar slide deck that you saw today with all of the uh, proper links and emails and everything you would need to do, um, not only uh, look at the sources and look at where our information is coming from, but also uh, get in contact with uh, Chris, Brian, or myself. Uh, I will also be sending a recording uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.